You're good to okay. there. Okay. And I woke up this morning with such a stuffy head from the weather. Okay. So you have your cameras all set up by the room? Yes. Plan that works for you to 
keep all of your information in order. Photographs are a great way to bring your ancestors to life. Ask around. Maybe some of your family members have photos. Do an internet search and keep asking around. Seriously, I got this off the internet and then I was so proud of it. I printed it out, took it to my dad and said, look what I found. And he said, oh, I have that picture. <laughs> <laughs> so keep asking and keep looking. Look for Facebook groups that are located in your ancestors' area. This one is called French Lick Memories and they post a lot of pictures and a lot of information on that. Now, as you move along, you may find living cousins. Don't be afraid to reach out to them, even if you don't know them. I've reached out to a lot of people that I've found that are my cousins, and they just totally blew me off. But I've also made really great connections doing my family tree, and it's really been through Facebook. It's a great tool. This is a reunion of some canon cousins that we had this summer at Cracker Barrel. They're my cousins. They live in Evansville, some, most of them. We didn't even know each other, and now we do, and it's really great. So another benefit to getting in there and doing your tree. And as I said, Facebook is really a great tool. I've made three, now three, Facebook groups for my, to keep all my cousins together. This is the Descendants of Godfrey Howard. And this is descendants of Joel Lyon. And then I just made one for the Cannon family because just to keep everybody together. Okay, let's take a, a quick look here at Hester Cannon's dad. He's my great great grandfather. Some people say two ex grandfather. From a newspaper article and from his obituary, we know that he was a lot of fun and he was a very nice man. His nickname in the community was Uncle John, and he played the fiddle. Played The fiddle. He played the fiddle. So comb through old hometown newspapers. This is my biggest secret. Many, now, a lot of these newspapers are on the internet. So all you have to do is you just open the site, and then you do a search engine search. Um, be sure when you're doing the search engine searches that you put in as many cross-references <coughs> as you can think of. For example, Hester Howard, Mrs. H. Howard, Mrs. <coughs> Howard, Hester Cannon, Mrs. William Howard, Mrs. Billy Howard. And I know a lot of you know this, but if I put in Hester Cannon in the search engine, I'm going to get all instances of Hester and all instances of Cannon brought back to my attention. That could be a lot, a lot. So if you put quotes around your search engine term, it will bring you back the exact term. So I will get just Hester Cannon back. You also want to keep in mind that in the 1800s, married women most likely used their husband's names and they were proud of it. Miss Hester Cannon became Mrs. William Howard. The Cannon family lived in a place called Mount Calvary, just north of Lagodi, Indiana. Mount Calvary, as you may have guessed, is on top of a hill. And it's a beautiful area with lots of trees. It's quiet and peaceful. There's not much going on at Mount Calvary. It's secluded, mostly farmland, trees, and a couple of houses. The houses that belong to my family are all gone. The cemetery is still there. The Methodist church that is by the cemetery is now a private home, and actually, through doing my presentation, I now am friends with the people who live in that Methodist church. It's very cool. Very good things happen. So go to the places where your ancestors lived. But if you can't, use Google Maps or Google Earth to see those places on your computer. <coughs> this is Mount Calvary Cemetery from Google Maps. There's the church, in the, which is now home. And here's the cemetery. You can see the little stones. A good frame of 
reference are the census records, as you know. My great-grandmother was born in 1864, so we'll start with the 1870 census. This is my great-grandmother, this highlighted line. In 1870, she was six years old, white and female. She lived with her mom, dad, brother, and sisters in Brown Township, Martin County, Indiana. Well, that's the cold facts of the matter, but let's look a little closer. And I retyped this hoping that it would be easier to read. It looks like my great-grandmother lived on a farm. Her older sisters went to school. 15-year-old girl going to school in 1860 is pretty remarkable. Her father had a thousand dollars worth of real estate. That's about a hundred thousand dollars in today's money. Her parents were both living. They were about the same age. Well, they were the same age. And there's not a, there's not a lot of death in this family. And what I mean by that is the brothers and sisters are all pretty close in age. And Elizabeth, who's 37, just had a new baby girl here. Melinda, who's three months old. Elizabeth is 37 and still having children, so we can assume, again, that this is a healthy family. Looking at this picture and comparing it with the census record makes me feel really good about my great-grandmother. It looks like she lived in a family of hard workers. They had resources. They had money. School was important. Looking at all this good information makes me think that at the end of every day, this family sat down together at the evening meal, and they talked about their day, and they laughed, and they kidded around, and I bet they took really good care of each other. In the picture, it looks like they're a really tight-knit family group. Let's continue on to the 1800 census and see what's happened in 10 years. Hester's parents are 10 years older. They're now 47. Her dad is still a farmer. Her mom is still keeping house. <coughs> if they were sick or disabled, the census enumerator would have put that in this column. He would have put disabled, he might put ill, he might have put insane. Insane covered a broad category of, of things back then. I noticed that Hester's eldest sister Mary isn't on the census, so let's assume that she got married and that she didn't die. Never ever assume that someone has died just because they disappeared off the census records. That's the most common. It's the most common genealogic mistake that I've run into that people make. Divorce was just as common in the 1800s as it is today, so don't let anyone tell you otherwise, because it was. It just wasn't well documented, because, well, very little was well documented back then. A man could just leave his wife, he could travel to another area, and he could say, hey, I'm widowed, and everybody would believe him. Or he could take his wife to a remote place and just drop her off. <laughs> Women had no rights in the 1800s. None. None at all. They were at the mercy of their fathers, <coughs> their brothers, and their husbands. If someone has disappeared, it could be that they got a divorce. Or that they're in jail. Or that they moved. Or that they're traveling. Or it could be that they were committed to an insane asylum. Evansville, Indiana had a rather large insane asylum called Woodmere Hospital. Your relatives might be here, listed on the census records as inmates. Sometimes if a man wanted to marry a younger woman, all he had to do was go to the court, have his wife declared insane, and then have her committed. It really was that easy. Sometimes it worked in the other direction, too. Escape patient he convinces Illinois people he is sane and was illegally held. His wife, who lives here, declares that he's crazy and tried to kill her. Of course, this has nothing to do with my great-grandmother, but it's always something to keep in mind should one of your ancestors suddenly 
disappear. So, let's go back to the 1880s census. Hester, James, and Melinda all are still at home, and they have a new sister, Adeline. At the last census, Melinda was the new child. And we see that she's 10 years old, so everything's driving really good. We also have a granddaughter listed, and I'm sorry that she's cut off. She's down here. Her name was Dory Queen, and she is two years old. <coughs> it's possible that the grandchild was just there for a visit. Census enumerators many times just counted everybody who was currently at home. And it's, it's not a, it was not a common at all for people to be counted twice. Here's a really good example. And I hope you can see it. The top census is 1910, Brown County, Mark, Brown Township, Mark County, Indiana. Gertie Lyons is listed in the household of her father, Joel. Alma and Mabel are Gertie's two daughters. This census record is incorrect. The bottom one is 1910 Mitchell Tree Township, Martin County, Indiana. This one is the correct one. Gertrude is listed with her husband, and the two daughters are listed with their parents. This is the correct one. Census enumerators were sometimes just more interested in first names, assuming that everyone had the same last name. And we know that the census enumerators did the best job they possibly could, but sometimes they didn't even get the last name correct. For instance, Joel's last name is Lion, not Lions with an S, but Lion, singular. So we've been talking about not assuming death. Unfortunately, Mary Cannon's daughter, Dory Queen, is in this photograph and she's obviously no longer two years old. Her mother Mary did die, but before learning this, I assumed the positive. Looking solely at the 1880 census, we'll want to assume that the grandchild is just there for a visit because that leaves the door open for a more positive outcome. The next big event for my great-grandmother is that she married William Howard in 1888. She didn't move far away from the homestead, just around the corner, so to speak. My dad told me that she and Billy lived in a log cabin that was still standing when he was a boy. After only about five years of being married, Hester's husband, Billy, died. He was one of the first to be buried in Mount Calvary Cemetery in 1894. My father told me that the weather was so bad when he died, freezing cold with snow on the ground, that the only way they could get his body to the cemetery was to carry him on their shoulders. Bad weather funerals are common. For instance, another of my great-grandmothers is buried by her daughter instead of by her husband because the weather was too bad to get her to the other cemetery. That's my other great-grandmother. Not only that, my grandmother, for religious reasons, was infuriated that her mother's second husband had previously been her brother-in-law. My grandmother refused to put her real last name of Painter on the stone. And not only that, from birth, my other great-grandmother was called Eva, not Amanda. These are the things that cause mystery. But the bottom line is, don't assume anything from where people are buried. And speaking of nightmares, Widower marries his mother-in-law. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My great-grandfather, Hester's husband, Billy, died of what was then called consumption, what we now call tuberculosis. In my first novel, Blood of My Ancestor, I wrote about Billy's disease and what Hester had to go through to take care of him. Many people died from tuberculosis in the late 1800s. Even though it can be a little depressing, one way to make your ancestors come to life is to study the things that occurred in their life, such as their illnesses. Knowing the things that they went through, even disease, will bring you closer to them. 
also studied the events that were occurring during their lifetimes, both national and local happenings, such as the Civil War or the local fair, and put all of those things on your timeline. Speaking of tuberculosis and speaking of Billy, if I'm not careful, I'll suddenly be working on Billy's family tree instead of my great-grandmother's. I'll put notes on my timeline of what I've learned about Billy, and then I'll work on his tree later. Going back to the census records, now that we're ready for 1890, probably all of you know that we have a problem. The majority of the 1890 census was lost in a tragic fire. Because of that, the next census year is 1900. A lot has happened to my great-grandmother in 20 years. By 1900, Hester's mother is dead. Her father is living in a boarding house. She is widowed and she has two young sons, ages nine and 10. Her husband has been dead for six years. Realizing what's going on in my great-grandmother's life at this time, the sorrow that I feel for her is overwhelming. How is she even functioning? <coughs> but then I look at the second half of this record, I see that my great-grandmother is a farmer. She can read and write. She owns her own farm, free and clear. She worked 12 months out of the year. It feels as if she should be devastated, but yet she's working. She's working for herself. She's taking good care of her two boys. Rural women didn't usually farm on their own in the 1900s, let alone making a living from it, and most could not read or write. Hester was an entrepreneur. She was educated. My sorrow over her situation has turned into great pride. She's taken what life has given her and turned it to her advantage. By 1910, not much has changed. Hester's been living life, taking care of her two beautiful boys, Rodolphus, whom they call Dolph, <coughs> and Earl. This is Dolph, her, her boy Dolph, and Earl, and this was my grandfather. Even at the ages of 19 and 20, they're still helping their mom out on the farm. By the 1920s, my great-grandmother has moved from her farm on Mount Calvary to Mill Street inside of the city limits of Lagovia, Indiana. 402 Mill Street, to be exact. This is 402 Mill Street today, according to Google Maps. Hester's son Earl, after a stint in the military, has now moved to New York and married Blanche Corey. Earl came back to see his mother a couple times every year. The 1920 census lists Hester's occupation as none. I know my great-grandmother well enough by now to know she must be doing something to bring in money. For rent, two nice rooms for a family of two. Also, garden plants, cheap. Mrs. Hester Howard, 402 Mill Street, Lagodi, Indiana. And notice she's using her own name. For sale, cabbage plants. Five cents per dozen or 35 cents per hundred. Early tomato, sweet mango, and hot pepper plants. 10 cents per dozen or three dozen for 25 cents. Egg plants, 10 cents per dozen. Mrs. Hester Howard, 402 Mill Street, Lagoni, Indiana. <coughs> my uncle once told a story he had heard about my great grandmother. He said her neighbor was harassing her. To get him to leave her alone, she threw a tomato right in his face. <laughs> Being a widow in the early 1900s, especially a hardworking, entrepreneurial, smart woman, I can imagine that Hester would be subject to some harassment. But it sounds like she can take care of herself. 
1921, my grandfather, Doth, finally got married. My father told me that the young couple lived with Doth's mom, uh, Hester, for about a year, which that was common at that time. But he also told me that Hester and my grandmother didn't get along very well. Well, knowing my grandmother Grace like I did, and now that I also know my great-grandmother too, I'm not at all surprised the two women didn't get along. By the 1930s, Hester is living alone on Mill Street, retired, age 65. Here she is on the left with two of her nieces in front of her home. Do you feel as if you know my great-grandmother? Would you be able to sit down with her over some coffee and have a nice conversation? <coughs> I sure wish I could. By the time we read her obituary, we feel we've really got to know her. We feel like we're reading the obituary of a very dear friend. Mrs. H. Howard called at age of 67. A member of one of the oldest and most highly respected members of the community was called in death when Mrs. Hester Howard passed away on this last Friday morning in her home in the south part of the city. She had been seriously ill for about a year, suffering from carcinoma of the liver. Her husband was William Howard, who preceded her in death about 40 years ago. Following the death of her husband, her son Rodolphus, now Reverend R. H. Howard of Burn City, and Earl Howard, now Binghampton, New York, continued to reside with her until recent years. <coughs> Mrs. Howard joined the Methodist Church in early girlhood and was a consistent adherent in the faith attending church as long as her health would permit. Funeral services were held on Sunday afternoon in the Mount Calvary Church, northwest of the city, and the remains were laid to rest in the nearby cemetery. The services were in charge of the local pastor, Reverend O. E. Killian. So here are your takeaways. Find your home person and stay with them. Be ready and willing to build a personal relationship with that home person, making sure that you stay open-minded with the things that you find out about them. Make a timeline. Try to find photographs. Go through old newspapers. Go to the places where your ancestors live, either in person or online, using Google Maps. Always make positive assumptions until you can prove otherwise. Never assume someone has died until you have proof. Keep looking for them until you find them. Ask your family members to tell you stories and write down or record every word and keep asking them and keep asking them and keep asking them. Study the events your ancestors would be familiar with. Census records are a good frame of reference. Always focus on the positive. Wait, wait, not done. <laughs> Stepson, and these are available. My books, I have three of them, and a fourth is coming in April of 2016 about Emily or Clifford. These are available online at Barnes and Noble or Amazon, or you go in the local Barnes and Noble and order it. If you have an e-reader, they're available almost everywhere that e-books are sold. 